So today what I'm here to do is to tell you about a project that we've been working on for a million years, looking at the nature of stories and narrative. And the basic idea is we've been trying to figure out, is there a kind of a common structure, a DNA to what stories are? And can we do this, can we figure this out using some kind of text analytic approach? I'm thinking maybe Luke. The studies that we did uh, involved tens of thousands of texts, uh, probably close to 100,000 when it comes right down to it. What we ended up doing was going through analyzing each and trying to see if there was a certain structure to narrative. Finally, this project ended and we were able to publish a paper on it in Science Advances in August of 2020. And fortunately, they wanted us to do a, a brief video that could give an overview of what we did and how we did it. And here we are at SPSP, we're now required to have a video this year, and I thought, huh, we've already done a video. So what I'm gonna do is show you a, a brief five minute video that's kind of an overview of what we did. Now this project was done by Ryan Boyd, P Kate Blackburn, and me. Uh, listen to Kate Blackburn as she narrates it, and sit back and enjoy, and I'll be back in a minute and tell you some more about the project. Many of us fell in love with stories when we were young. They started off once upon a time, and after a harrowing adventure, they ended with, and they lived happily ever after. We've studied stories from around the world, and the beginnings and endings are similar. The content of the stories are different, but their structures are alike. Consider a classic African tale from Zanzibar called The Hare and the Lion. The story begins, one day, Sungora, the hare, roaming through the forest in search of food, glanced up through the boughs of a very large calabash tree and saw that a great hole in the upper part of the trunk was inhabited by bees. Here, the author is setting the stage for the story by introducing the characters, the setting, and other background information. Look at the words that help to set the stage. Day, Sungora, hare, roaming, forest, search, food. But look at what we don't see. An entire world of small, common, and almost invisible words connecting these content words. Many of these hidden words are articles, such as a, an, and the, and prepositions, such as through, of, in. In fact, articles and prepositions are required at the beginning of a story for the stage to be set. Now, let's jump to the last sentence of the story. But it was of no use. Sungora completely tired out old Simba, who saying, That rascal has beaten me. I don't want to have anything more to do with him. Returned to his home under the great calabash tree. Compared to the beginning, there are very few articles and prepositions. Instead, there is a high rate of other short common words like pronouns, such as it, me, him, auxiliary verbs, such as was, has, is, and a mix of other very short words like negations and conjunctions. What this tells us is that different parts of the stories are inhabited by different categories of words, especially the short common connector words, often called function words. By looking at just the function words, it is possible to identify the underlying structure of stories, no matter their length or content. Welcome to the Arc of Narrative. Since Aristotle, scholars have argued that stories share a basic structure. Authors need to set the stage at the beginning, have some kind of climax in the middle, and then tie everything together at the end. The problem is, no one can agree on how to identify or measure these dimensions. We wondered if we could see this structure by looking at those small, hidden function words, instead of paying attention to the themes of stories. To do this, we computer analyze thousands of stories, ranging from epic novels and short stories to off-the-cuff stories created by everyday people to identify staging, plot progression, and cognitive tension. Think back to the beginning of The Hare and the Lion. To set the stage, articles and prepositions are needed to provide information about people, places, and things. We expected that articles and prepositions would be used at the highest rates at the beginning of stories and would drop as the story unfolded. Our results found just this. 
If you look more closely, you can see that this narrative trend holds across novels, short stories, and amateur stories. Narrative structure then is not tied to content, length, or formality, but it is something deeper, more universal. Once the stage is set, the story can begin. Words that reflect movement and change over time should increase. We use a combination of words, but two of the main players are auxiliary verbs and pronouns, which by their very nature are action-oriented and social. We assume that over the course of the story, markers of plot progression would increase. And that's what we found across all story genres. Finally, there's the story's climax. Characters often confront challenges and conflict towards the middle of the story. A group of words called cognitive tension words, such as think, realize, or because, reveal when people are trying to make sense of their world. We argued that cognitive tension words would start low in the story, peak around the middle, and then fall as the story ended. And again, our computer analyses found just that. All three types of stories show peaks in their use of cognitive tension words in the middle of the story. That there is a measurable and visible underlying structure to stories raises dozens of questions. For example, do good stories have a different structure from bad ones? Do other works such as nonfiction show the same narrative patterns? To learn more, check out our paper along with the supplemental information. If you'd like to explore the narrativity of text on your own, we've developed a website where you can look at the arcs of hundreds of published books and movie scripts with the option of uploading your own text samples. We are at the threshold of a new world that can help us understand the very nature of language, stories, and communication. Contact us if you have any questions. So you have the basic idea of what we mean by arc of narrative. I'd like to tell you just a little bit more and give you some of the details. So how do you do it? Well, conceptually, it's fairly easy. What you can do in any given text is you go through and the first thing you do is to segment it into equal, equal word segments. We arbitrarily for this project broke all of our texts into five equal sizes. It doesn't matter how long the text is or how long it took the, the author to put it together. We break them into five equal segments and then we use Luke, the Luke program to analyze the language within each one. And remember there were three primary dimensions. There was the, the staging, plot progression, and the cognitive tension. Now this, the, the first one, staging, is that the idea here is that when you first meet somebody, when you are just beginning to tell a story, the first thing you have to do is kind of lay out where are the people, who are the, who are the people, what is the situation. You have to label things. What that means is at the beginning of a story, there are lots of nouns. And one thing that goes with nouns are articles, a, n, and d, and prepositions, two of four. That articles and prepositions are really powerful proxies for essentially nouns. And what you would expect if you're studying the stage, you will have a high rate of those at the very beginning of the story and they drop over time because you don't need to continue to, to make reference to the people and the objects in a formal way. And that's what we found and that's what you saw in the videos. And what's interesting is that these dimensions hold up across multiple genres. The three that I want to show you that are nonfiction genres are uh, TED Talks, and you can see here that they do indeed drop. Same thing for New York Times. And the one anomaly is our Supreme Court decisions. One reason for this is the, the nature and the formality of Supreme Court decisions and the nature of the audience that's reading them. But when we look at many other types of genres, which are uh, everything from poems and music lyrics to um, CEO transcripts of quarterly calls, all, anything you can think of, we, we get the typical staging phenomenon. Now the second one is plot progression. Once you've set the stage, now stuff can happen. Two, things, two primary things are, occur. One is once you've set the stage, so you, you know all the characters and the objects and locations, the author can now use shortcuts. And that's what pronouns essentially are. Instead of saying Mr. Smith, you can just say he. Or that uh, he, picked, he, he drank his coffee. Now, now they can say he drank it. 
But the real action is going to occur with verbs, and especially certain types of verbs, auxiliary verbs. These are words like uh, is, was, have, had, were, words such as that. And these auxiliary verbs tend to expand action. It makes it more, more almost in your face. And what you, we expected and found was that over the course of a story, the deeper you got into it, the more there is uh, plot progression. There are more pronouns, there are more auxiliary verbs. And these have held, held up across every one of our genres. Let me just show you these. So again, you've already seen the, the novels, the short stories, and um, the TATs, but they hold up for the, the TED Talks, the, uh, uh, the others. Now the most interesting is the dimension of cognitive tension. Now cognitive tension is interesting because, and in, in Luke terms, this is the cognitive processing dimension, which is when people are using cognitive process words, they're trying to work through an issue. They're trying to understand it. And the words that make it up are words that include insight words, words like understand, realize, know, meaning. They also refer to uh, causal words, because, cause, effect, reason, rationale, and also words such as, uh, that we call self-discrepancy words, words like would, should, could, ought, and tentative words, maybe, perhaps, etc. These words are interesting because all of them are getting at this idea of working something through. And in, in, as you saw in the video, with fiction, we tend to work things through, the author tends to work things through at the middle of the book. And that's exactly what we found. And, and once you get to the end, now you, you don't need to work it through anymore and life is beautiful. That the cognitive tension dimension is the most interesting and is an important um, fingerprint of, of genre itself. And what we discovered was that for nonfiction stories, the cognitive process dimension worked completely opposite. So for example, if we look at uh, TED Talks, what you see is at the beginning, uh, the low cognitive process, in the middle, low cognitive process, but at the end, cognitive process goes up. And the same pattern works with our, our other dimensions as well, the New York Times uh, articles, as well as Supreme Court decisions. And in fact, all of the nonfiction uh, narratives that we study. And why is this? Well, it's because in a TED Talk, for example, it starts off, the person is laying out what the issues are, then lays out how they went about looking for the problems and they came up with some solutions. But at the end, they're always asking, what does this mean? What are the implications? What should I do next? And in fact, if you do an analysis on your, on your uh, the last paper that you wrote, you will find that your cognitive process words are highest at the end. So what you see is, with these various dimensions, we are learning about the nature of, of text and the way that stories are put together. So let's stand back for just a second and think about the big picture. What does all this mean? Do stories that adhere to a arc of narrative the way we've seen it, are they better stories than those that don't? Uh, so, for example, we looked at 15,000 movies and their, their, uh, the subtitles and looked at those movies that were rated highly versus those that weren't. We did the same thing for a number of books, romance novels, about 500 of those. We found that the ratings of the movies and books were completely unrelated to whether or not the, the, they showed the arc of narrative pattern. In other words, even a bad movie, a bad book, is still structured the same way that a good one is. So does it have any psychological importance? Well, it, there's a kind of an irony here. I got into all of this because of the work I had done on expressive writing. Many years ago, we, what we discovered was that if people were asked to write about upsetting experiences, that their health improved. And I was curious, why did people's health improve? Could you look at the writing and analyze it in some way to figure it out? But now with the Arc of Narrative project, we're now going back and looking at about 20 different expressive writing studies. And in a project that Kate Blackburn's been doing with Oliver da Davidson and me, what we've been discovering is, is that we do see differences. And specifically, people who write about traumatic experiences and show this a peak cognitive tension in the middle as opposed 
as opposed to the end, they are the ones who benefit more. Comparing those to at least half the people who over time in their writing, it increases in cognitive process and then continues to increase. And you can think of almost, think about this from the nature of therapy, that those people who confront an upsetting experience, they work through it, and then afterwards, they're not talking about it as much. They're not as thinking about it as much. So that's a marker of benefit. But if at the end of expressive writing, they're still doing a lot of processing, they're not likely to benefit. So this is just the beginning of this, of this research. And it also points to this, uh, such an interesting way to start thinking about text in ways that we've never done before. I urge you to start playing with this. It's a, there, there's many ways to do it. And there, the, there's a website that you can go to. It's archofnarrative.com. And uh, I encourage you to play around with it. One final warning, however. The arc of narrative looks beautiful when you're dealing with very large data sets. And this is, a, this is one of the conundrums of working with big data. With big data, you see these beautiful curves, but still we're not accounting for that much variance. Our Ds are, frankly, uh, between 0.03 and at best a 0.1, maybe a little bit higher than that. So the effect sizes are not huge, but if you have lots of text, it's very easy to do and very easy to see if there's a signal there. Hope this is helpful. If you have any questions, I look forward to hearing from you. Bye-bye.